Welcome to Markets Now. I'm Michelle Work with Sean Hackett with Hackett Financial Advisors. Seeing a lot of red on the ag sector board this morning with the exception of wheat and the cotton markets a little bit higher. But Sean, let's start off talking about soybeans and corn, both lowered this morning. Soybeans obviously have been getting a push here with some China business, maybe some South American weather concerns, but setting back today, is that some profit taking? Did we run up into resistance or are we just squaring up ahead of the report? Yeah, I mean, it's some profit taking. We have this report, you know, no one ever really knows what the USDA is going to say. Even though we've gotten some business from China, we obviously need a lot more to really get too excited about it. Um, even though some private estimates of saying that the soybean crop might have gotten a little smaller, I doubt the USDA will be willing to say that in this report. I think they're going to be perfectly comfortable keeping the yields where they're at and giving another month to look at things to maybe make some changes. So, so I just think when you still look at it, you know, the, the supply side of the equation remains heavy and we're not far enough along in Brazil weather planting delays to excite the market just yet. I think we need to get into October before we could see weather become a driving force for the soybean price. Yeah. So let me ask you about, you said you, you don't think USDA is going to make many adjustments in terms of yield on soybeans. Have we already priced the biggest numbers in? If we get a flat yield, does the market keep rallying? I don't think that's basis for rallying. I think we, my view is that the August lows in grains that we made likely was the, 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 the price level that traded the largest supplies, at least on the spreadsheets that we're going to trade for this crop cycle. It doesn't mean it's up, up and away, and here we go, but it means that we've, we've sufficiently priced all of that. And then incrementally, we're going to start probably taking little pieces of this supply off and the market will start to work its way higher, grinding higher, two steps forward, one step back. And I think this is the one step back to the two steps forward that doesn't feel great, but the market start makes gradual, slow headway until we can get a better handle on the nature of what's going on in Brazil. And if this historic drought is going to really carry out into mid, late October, which could significantly impact yields on soybeans, planted acreage on soybeans, and obviously yields and uh, planted acreage on second crop corn that gets planted behind it. Yeah. Now, as far as yield, you know, that's very hard to determine on soybeans. So what's going to be the main determinant, do you think here? You know, crop ratings coming in yesterday, actually a little bit better than expected and they've been high pretty much all season does that you know equate to these high yields record yields we're gonna have really good yields you know i'm i'm not really you know in the camp that says the yields are way off base i mean i don't think there's anything that says these the soybean yields are going to be anything other than really really good um and that's why i'm saying is though i don't think i don't i don't think we're in the zone where they're going to be dramatically higher than where they're at you know like like to me, to get yourself more bearish than everybody was in August, you'd have to feel that you know we're really get, we, that we have another major notch higher in yields to go. And I don't really see that. I, I don't really think that that's going to be um, what we're looking at here. I think we've settled into where we're at. And the question is, can we get demand going to get some of this ending stock overhang in the soybean market down so that it doesn't look so daunting on the historical perspective, you know, on the stocks to usage in the U.S., the stocks to usage uh, globally. You know, I just think that, that that's what we're going to be looking at is just taking some of that overhang off going into what could be an historic dry planting season for Brazil soybeans. Yeah. And I know after the last uh, WASD report, certainly there was a lot of talk about inning stocks on beans being above 600 million bushels. So hopefully we have that programmed in. What about corn? What do we have programmed in there? Do we need to see yield stay flat or do we need to be under 2 billion bushels on the report on Thursday to get the market to stay where it's at even? I don't, I mean, I, I, I think my view is that when, when we were trading whatever it was, 385 December corn, something like that, that we were trading, I felt close to 185 yield. I don't think, you know, we're too far off from where we are right now. I don't think the yields are going to go up much. Um, they might have come down a little, but for the most part, I think we've traded the highest ending stocks. And in, and in the way I'm looking at demand, this continues to be better. Um, harvested acres, I think, need to keep continue to come off here. 
old crop stocks probably need to continue to come off here. I believe we're going to see corn ending stocks in the U.S. come in under 2 billion bushels by the October release of the WASDE report. That to me says, you know, current prices aren't high enough and that the August prices were too low. It's not $6 corn, but a, a mid fours to me, looking at those numbers makes more sense, especially with all the risks that we have going into the Brazil growing season and what that might mean for second crop corn and the poor crop that we had last year in Brazil. You know, everything says to me that, um, you know, prices can kind of hang in here. We don't need to go back and retest the lows unless there's some kind of a massive liquidation in asset markets that takes everything down like we were seeing late last week. That's always a risk, very hard to predict. No doubt. Um, and so the rally that we've had, you don't think necessarily has been the market trying to pull down the crop. Has it been more fun short covering? It's been fun short covering. I think the market felt that the crop yields were going to be substantially higher. And I think when you look at the, the hot, dry finish that we've had and some of the private estimates that do some good work, lowering yields slightly, I think the market's getting very comfortable that we're really not going to see the crop getting dramatically bigger from here. And if we don't get dramatically bigger from here, I don't I don't see the basis for why we need to go down. I mean, the way, the way we look at it, we look at corn and soybeans and wheat relative to all commodities and relative to all ag markets. And when we run those numbers going back to 1948, the August lows were the number one cheapest against all ag markets and the third cheapest against all commodities since 1948. That's awfully, awfully undervalued. Just because a market is undervalued doesn't mean it can't stay that way, but it says that we price in a lot of bearishness to have those asset markets trade that undervalued relative to the price levels of everything else. You really need to get something far more bearish than you know, what we where we're at in order to do that. And I don't think we're going to get it. Yeah. At four year lows on corn and soybeans, you got to believe that we maybe got a little bit too cheap there for sure. Uh, let's talk about the wheat market. Uh, you know, we've been kind of following corn and soybeans on the rally up here, but what do you think we need to keep that market going up? I mean, is there going to be a weather problem that we're going to be watching here either in the U S or globally? Is that what it's going to take? Well, we're, I think it's first thing it's going to take is going to take continuous strong demand of exports in the U.S. And we're seeing that. So part of this rally is we're just seeing really, really strong demand for U.S. wheat. Secondly, I mean, if you're going to if you want a sustainable rise in the wheat price, you need to continue to worry about Russia, Ukraine. They already had a crop that was approximately 15 percent off in aggregate from from a year ago. That took the punch bowl away. Right now they're dealing with. Uh, subsoil moisture that's in the top five worst in history, going back to 1950. And it doesn't look to me like we're going to get meaningful rainfall, at least through mid-October, which means less acres. The planting of those acres that do get done are going to be in poor condition. They're going to go dormancy in poor condition, poor stands. And that means that they're going to be greater risk for frost damage and for issues coming out of dormancy in the spring. And the market can ill afford having two years in a row of below normal production from the number one exporter region in the world. Yeah. Cotton market is up just a little bit this morning, but definitely that's been a market that's been quite disappointing. Obviously we're economically sensitive. So where do you see the market going from here? Yeah. If, if you look at crude oil and you look at cotton, they kind of been following each other, Michelle, because both of them are cyclically sensitive. Cotton always competes with synthetic fibers, which are made from petroleum. So you always have to keep that in mind. There's a link there. But when I look at um, the cyclical commodities like lumber, like cotton, even like crude oil or, or some of the industrial metals, they tend to go up early in the interest rate cut cycle, which appears we're going to start here in the next Fed meeting here in mid-September. Um, and on top of it, we have Francine that's coming right into the core deep south cotton areas with the bowls wide open right now. And, you know, we don't know exactly how that's going to look. It's supposed to make landfall tomorrow afternoon, but it looks right now based on the track that we're going to have some significant damage for that uh, deep South cotton uh, acreage down there. And, and that's going to make the crop smaller and the quality reduced for what the demand would like to see from us cotton. So overall, you know, it's been a little bit of a disappointing market, but I do think this market has potential to go higher 
on weather and on the expectations for improved demand based upon Fed rate policy. Yeah. So since you mentioned the Fed rate policy, they're meeting next week. Obviously, we wa we're watching and anticipating a rate cut. But you've got that. You've got the election uh, coming up. The stock market has been very volatile. Does all that continue to churn here? And what impact could that have on the ag markets? Well, we already saw, you know, late last week, we had one of these convulsions and the grains got hit and everything got hit, right? I don't think we're done with that. I mean, if you look at some of the policies that are being thrown out there by both sides of who are going to be our next president, you know, it's a lot of uncertainty of what that means to exports. What does that mean to monetary policy, fiscal policy? What does it mean to the economy? Um, I don't think anyone can look at that and say that they feel comfortable with the pathway forward. My view, you know, Michelle, is is to just make sure you're, you're co you've covered yourself into the end of the year. If you need to sell at harvest, if you know you have to sell, you have to raise cash, do it. Because I just don't think anyone can navigate what's going to happen here into the end of the year with all these moving pieces. And when you have that much uncertainty, I still believe a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush um, until we know more. Now, once you know who won and who's going to get in and what their policies are and you can gauge it, well, that's different. But until then, I'd want to have I'd want to bring some money home on the farm and protect myself in case there's further downsides. We know September and October historically have been not very good for asset markets over the years. Um, so this is a, a dangerous time for further downside potential that can take grain markets down, whether that's fundamentally correct or not. It can do it anyway because speculative capital sells anyway. Thanks for that advice. Uh, that's Sean Hackett with Hackett Financial Advisors and Markets Now.